So, PG Tips Monkey. I was part of the auditions for being the voice of the PG Tips Monkey. <laughs> oh, no way. Ladies and gentlemen, please hold for Some Boy Online. Coming soon. Off. In today's sort of podcast thing, we've got, I've got some notes here because he has that many credits. He's voiced Shaggy and Scooby-Doo and Johnny Bravo and Bob the Builder in the US and voiced the the, the narrator on the Pingu show. <laughs> Characters in Star Wars, Chicken Run, what? Fifi and the Flower Tots. Fancy blueberries, Fifi! And worked alongside Peter K in Rory the Racing Car, which is particularly cool. And not to mention to me, it was the voice of Bradley Bear from the Flippin' Zoo Troop. Bradley Bear! From Haven Parks. Just <laughs> tremendously cool. So how are you doing, Mark? I'm great. How are you doing? Very nice. Thanks for taking the time to even check up on this. It's, it's really nice to talk to you. I, I am, uh, you've got a, uh, got a fan right here of your videos. <laughs> Incredible. And likewise, I'm a fan of, of your stuff and I've been for a while without even knowing it. Thank you. What? Okay, what didn't you know then? Well, I'm trying to... Well, anything really, because <laughs> like the the for example, the Bradley Bear thing, I, I'd seen that mentioned somewhere, and I was like, mm. "What?" Because the, the characters like that just aren't credited, as far as I know. Mm. Like that was never mentioned or information that was available. Yeah, because because that character it it turned into quite a big deal, really. Because if you went on holiday to any of these these parks in the UK, there was character there was a thing called the Zoo Troop. And I played the character, I was the voice of a character called Bradley Bear. And if you went to those parks, you'd have seen these shows. And it becomes a big part of what you look forward to on the holidays. So clearly you saw those. Yeah. Well, we had a, a caravan there for a number of years. So most weekends would get the most out of it and end up going again and again. And yeah, as a, as a little kid, they were as much to me as like Mickey Mouse or something. If you've gone there, especially regularly, it's a big thing that you look forward to. And there's merchandise and DVDs and songs, and you become very fond of those characters if, if you, that's mm -hmm. part of your holiday. For me, uh, 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 in a similar way, a lot of people would never have heard of a character called Figment unless you've been to Epcot. My mum and dad took us to Epcot in 1988 when all this was just fields and black and white. And there was a, an attraction called Journey into Imagination and it was with Figment and Dreamfinder. So Figment was this little purple dragon. He was a figment of your imagination. Hi, Dreamfinder, I'm Figment, him. <laughs> and he, there, was a, there were no cartoons you could watch. He wasn't on TV. There was no film. The only place you saw him was in Epcot. After the ride, there was a meet and greet with Dreamfinder and Figment. And it became one of the highlights of the of the holiday for me. And every time I went back, I'd want to see Dreamfinder and Figment. And after after so long, they um, it did, the, the attraction was kind of like wiped from the park and they did a new version of it, which wasn't so popular. Anyway, fast forward to... A year or so back, Disney released a popcorn bucket of figment. And there were five-hour queues all around Epcot wow. for this popcorn <laughs> bucket. And the point of me saying this is, here's a character that really you would only know if you went to Epcot. But it w there was so much love for this character, it became the unofficial ma mascot of, of Epcot. And similarly, these characters in... Uh, the the parks across the UK, they became quite a big deal if that's what, what you went to. So I, I got brought in, uh, like, oh, I, I was probably doing it for, it must have been nearly a decade. There was an animation version of it that, that had been created in Canada, I think it was. They brought it over to the UK and they cast me as this character and they wanted to sort of... Um, help the voice performance along a little bit. <laughs> In initially, it, it started out a little bit sounding like it was red a bit, to be honest, because mm. there'll be some shows that you watch and you can hear that it's being read. It's somebody reading words, reading a, <laughs> hello, how are you today? You know, you, you can hear that <laughs> someone's reading words. And the, any, any show that you tend to love or, you know, performance, it sounds like it's real. You know, a, a, a great performance should, to me should sound like you kind of, you're eavesdropping on, on a, a, a moment, like someone's just dipped a microphone in a room. Yeah, it's it's that you're you're sharing something that's real. You know, any of the characters that we that we just adore, it, that's how it works. So I tried to, I, I initially you've got to make the transition from where it was to where it where you want it to be 
But yeah, so I, I was brought in to be the voice of this um, this bear, and and he was a lovely, happy, happy-go-lucky guy, that kind of guy, which is <laughs> sort of how they started it off there, but I kind of jazzed it up a bit. But he went on for a long time. He did, yeah. So did you, so you started off with the animated series, and then did you transition into the, yeah. the live sort of shows until it finished recently? Yes. So I, I, we recorded those uh, at a studio in London and they were huge fun, the recording sessions. And then we moved them out to another studio uh, and it carried on. There were songs and stories and uh, and yeah, I would I would go in a few times a year and we'd record new things and updates. And it was it was it was good. And then, you know, things move on. And the, what was interesting was. It might have even been something that I saw that popped up that happened to be you. I had no idea of the affection for these characters. Neither did I really. It was a very strange thing. For some reason, it was me little sister originally. It came in, it was something on TikTok, whatever it said. They're getting rid of the, the zoo troop. And we all went to the caravan when we were younger. So we all remember them. And that was seen as like a big deal. And as I was doing videos, I thought, well, that's something that was sort of close to me from my childhood. I wonder if anyone else would care. I thought, oh, I'll do a video on it anyway and see. And there was so many comments of, of people who did. It's got over 10,000 views, I think. Whoa. Yeah. <laughs> that's probably more than some of the actual videos. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's <Crazy>. great. <laughs> yeah, that really is one. Nice job with the with the uh, the video. Thank you. Because it it let me know the affection for it, which I had no idea about. I did mm -hmm. not know that there was that kind of fondness for for the characters. Uh, um, but yeah, you know, things change, they move on, and you know that's okay. But it was, you know, I think it was probably thanks to you that I became aware of uh, that it had a good little following for quite a while. We must have, I think, at least one Bradley still in the garage. I would have um, <laughs> dug him out, but there will be one somewhere. That's where I am. We had, we had one each, but honestly, I think I always said Bradley was my favourite one. Thank you. And now, live from Jordan's Carriage, <laughs> resurrecting <laughs> your favourite shows. We're back, baby. It's the closest <laughs> I'll get. <laughs> Crazy. Well, yeah, if if I end up in your garage, like just puppeteering shows in the middle of the night, you know, it's, it's fine. Nothing to worry about. There's a Dalek in there as well. And when I say a Dalek, I mean a real one. So, you know, <laughs> I'm actually probably a big Dalek or about three quarters of one. Did you did you make it? No, it's an actual BBC one, but that's a, um, <laughs> I won't I'm going to do a story thing on it soon. A video, sorry, that I've recorded. So do I need to have a word with David Tennant about this? <laughs> <laughs> so looking online, basically, uh, what came to mind is that, that you're like a, a Jim Cummins sort of character and that you look at these things, you know how he did lots of um uh, impressions. If anyone needed impressions or little replacement characters or whatever, it's just like yeah. get get this guy. That seems to be you a lot of the time. Well, yeah, because I th especially when I started out, because when you're starting out, your only point of reference are your heroes. So you know things that have existed before you. So you know if you're learning how to play. Um, the, you know, um, I, I, I learned how to play the piano when I was seven and I loved Billy Joel. Well, so I just wanted to play Billy Joel tunes because I hadn't written any. So I wanted to play his stuff. But like with any musician, same with voice work or, or any, any creative thing, after a while, you start writing your own songs mm. and then you find your own voice. And that's how it was with voices. So what you said is exactly it. Yeah. So I, I, because my background, I started in radio as a producer. So I was the button guy. I was the guy on the mixing desk. I was um, doing music production, writing, directing other voice actors for little, um, for promo stuff for radio. Then I started writing sketches for things and needed voices for what I was doing. And there was no one else to do it. So I did it myself. And it all kind of like went from there. But in the, my, I did a radio show for a few years. Um, I got offered a, a gig on Radio One, like six months into me doing this, and I, I was so uh, over the moon about it. And I, I went down, talked to them, and I, I politely declined because I just wasn't ready for it yet. Oh know? wow! Well, there's that point when you do think it, it's really important to do stuff when it's right for you. You know, mm. to not be as over the moon as I was. I just wasn't ready for that. I was still learning. And the guy there said, well, but you'll always be learning. And I said, well, yeah, but there's a benchmark that I, I know in my, in my ears, 
that I should be at. I'm not quite there yet. I was proud of it, but it should be a certain, you know, to me, I knew I could be better. So, you know, there was that. But after the radio show, um, I pushed for doing animation work. I'd learned how to, to be a, a decent producer. I'm a, I'm a good audio producer. Uh, and I... Because my my love is all this stuff. You know, I, I adore characters. My heroes are, are everyone from you know, Jim Henson, Frank Oz, Mel Blanc, uh, Del Messick, Dawes Butler, um, Freddie Mercury, Aretha Franklin, name them. It, they're massively diverse, you know, Monty Python, you know, name them, they're all there. And so I put this, I, I wanted to, I, I was doing a lot of character creation, character performance for the sketches I was doing in radio, but I wanted to do animation. It, and it was not straight voices, animation and I put this showreel together with and so it was a really great sounding showreel to showcase what I do and you heard this very familiar Warner Brothers style music and then you heard hi I'm Mark Silk I do cartoon voices and then it was like a like 20 voices in 20 seconds <laughs> and it was it was nothing original of my creation it was me really it was a love letter to my my favorite character performance, mm. you know, and it was, you are despicable. This is the last time I work with someone with a speech impediment. What's up, Doc? Say your prayers, you lop-eared varmint, or I'll blast you to smithereenies. <coughs> uh, that's right, Fred. Come on, Betty, let's go. You know, it's, it's uh, I try to have pudding tat. You bet you Thor a pudding tat. That pudding tat of me. And I went through all these um, characters that I loved and it was and it was you know, it's like, like man it's really creepy scoob old pal right scoob scooby dooby doo <laughs> and so starting you know um um it was decent to start out with and it was one of those things that it kind of let people know where you were and what you were about and um i sent um i sent a i sent 10 show reels off um, um, hoping I get a one in ten response. You know, if I got one back after sending ten out, I thought that'd be great. And I got thirteen responses. <laughs> it, it went cassette viral. And um, one of the people that got back in touch was Cartoon Network, and they said, "Thank you for reaching out to us. We've never heard of you. We have no need for you. We have to meet you." <laughs> and then I got to. Um, I, it took about a year to get any work from them because, you know, it, it, real life and all that. But what you said was very true. So initially, I was getting brought in to recreate or, or breathe life into c classic animation characters. For about a year, there was a thing on Cartoon Network where Droopy took your, you know, red mail that was sent to Droopy. And it was, hello, you happy people. You know what? I'm happy. I'm feeling kind of happy. And so I, I was brought in to be droopy for ages. And then um, I, I, when there were promos and commercials and things um, for, for Cartoon Network characters in the UK, it's me that was brought in to be them mostly, if or not entirely. And it was everything from like Bugs and Taffy and Sylvester and Yosemite Sam and, and then, you know, um, Hannah Barbera. There was loads of stuff. And uh, and it was a thrill. It was dream stuff. Well, there must know, have been, yeah. I thought yeah. like you, you probably wouldn't have been bothered about whether you appeared or not. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, the first TV gig I got um, was with CITV. So I was, I was, I got sort of uh, people were saying nice things about me in radio. i I was based in Birmingham, still am, well, Sally Hill. And there's a station called BRMB in Birmingham, which turned into Free Radio and then others, but. BRMB was a, a big radio station and literally, you know, five minutes down the road was Central TV, which is where CITV came from live. And the guy that did the continuity live was going away for a couple of weeks. Mm. The person that was head of CITV called BRMB and said, do you know someone that would do this, do a good job? And they said, well, he's, he's worth a go. <laughs> so I was so thrilled. Because it's like the big TV station. It's live across the whole country. When that red light goes on, the whole country can potentially listen to you. Wow. Get it wrong. <laughs> you know? So, and what I did, um, you know, in, in, the, in the bumpers, in the bits, in the coming up next on CITV, you know, all that stuff, 
this, I'm really happy, that bit. Um, there you you get the video of a few clips of shows that are coming up later. And inevitably, there'd be a Warner Brothers cartoon or Scooby-Doo, something like that. And I thought, well, I, I can perform these characters. I'll do them live. You did them. <laughs> yeah, but I did it to picture Lie in sync. So I got the video of what, what? we were going to show <laughs> beforehand. And I, I looked at the lip flaps of what of what they were doing. Then I wrote stuff that would fill the lip flaps. That's so crazy. It was, Next on CITV, the <laughs> Sylvester and Twitty mysteries. Woo-hoo! See, that's now, love and dedication that only a fan well, could it, have. It was fun. That's what it was. It was fun. And the guy that um, I got told by the producer that I was working with, that the guy that was on holiday, and he was a good guy, but he came back. He, he, he ended up talking to that producer and said, oh, I see you're doing a lot of pre I see you're doing pre-records then. And he went, what do you mean? He said, you know, the stuff that's in, you know, the stuff to picture, the character voices. And he went, no, he's doing that live. <laughs> and I was you know, very <laughs> proud about that. But the first... The first day that I was doing CITV Live, bear in mind, is it today that CITV actually ends for good? I think it's today. Oh, was it really? Yeah. That would be depressing. Depressing. Do you know what year would, would this have been when you got started? Because I'm wondering how much I could have heard when, like, when I, I, I was younger. Th- this was late late 90s, so probably about 90, 90, okay. 97, 98. Not yet born then. <laughs> Yeah, well, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I send you the tapes. So there's, I've got a lot of them. I, I, I am going to share some of these. But on the very first day, and it was so exciting because this was when, it, this was back when the TV stations were big buildings that the shows were made in. You know, you when you walked in there, walked around them, you felt like you'd ar- arrived. It's like if you walked around a movie studio, you felt like, you know, this this means something, this matters. So going around there, I felt like, you know, I, I just kind of started to make it. So, so it was going okay. If only. And, um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And then in the, this booth where you we, we did the, the voice, the continuity for CITV, there was a, a bat phone with a red light on. And, you know, if the bad phone went off, it's usually trouble. You know, the <laughs> Queen's dead or something like that, you know. And um, <laughs> just before the last link on my first shift on, on doing CITV Live, literally 30 seconds before it, the, the red light rang, the red light went. And it's like, oh, God. So I picked this phone up and the, this voice says, are you the guy doing the, the continuity on CITV right now? I said, yeah. And he said, I work for Disney. I used to work there. Will you come and work for us, please? <laughs> <laughs> and, and I said, can you hang on just 30 seconds? I've got to do a link. <laughs> and then and I was like, that's it for now. See you tomorrow for more great fun on CITV. Yes. <laughs> and then for a, a, yeah, And then for a couple of years, I would go down regularly to the Disney Channel. And it was at... Uh, T- at uh, in Teddington, uh, Teddington Studios, and uh, so and yeah, they had studios there, and it was the, again really exciting because it, it's where things like um, you, know, you know big chat shows and comedy shows were all recorded down there, and my uh, my hero uh, Kenny Everett, a lot of his stuff was done there, and you know there's loads of stuff. I was the voice that you heard that went the magical world of Disney, you know, all that stuff. Next on Disney, you know, very friendly and warm and Aren't I lovely? You know, it was all that stuff. I think that's that's what your voice is naturally that strikes me is that it's warm and friendly. So that's probably why they went with it, yeah. That's me. I'm friendly and warm. <laughs> that's yeah. What, uh, yeah. Like a pair. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's it, yeah, yeah. So that that went on for a good couple of years. And then bit by bit, um it turned it turned into the, the the TV stuff turned into animated series and it kind of all kind of went from that moment what would you say were your your biggest you know biggest inspirations and, and stuff like that i think we share a lot of the same um heroes i really. think so a, a huge one for me was jim henson so so i i grew up adoring the muppet show and you know, Jim Henson, Frank Oz, uh, Dave Goles, the whole team over there. That was magic to me. So uh, I, as a kid, I loved it because it was funny, 
but it also it was showbiz and edgy. And I think a lot of people forget almost how edgy the Muppets was always meant to be. You know, the pilot episode of the Muppet Show was called Sex and Violence. Yeah. That isn't what a lot of people <laughs> think of the Muppet Show. Uh, but I adored the Muppet Show, and at the, and, um, at the same time, I also loved you know Thunderbirds and Stingray, and there was this whole mix of things. Did you know of the link between Thunderbirds and the Muppet Show? I did not, but my dad was a huge fan of both of them, so this would be interesting. Yeah. Well, <laughs> this tends to happen with, with creative stuff. You tend to go, oh, my word, there's this whole, you know, yeah. degrees of separation. So the Muppet Show was greenlit by Lou Grade. Lou Grade also greenlit Thunderbirds and Stingray and Captain Scarlet and Joe Knighty and all those shows. And without Lou Grade greenlighting that, we might not be where yeah. we are with our love of all this. So we like puppets. <laughs> yes, the whole thing. And then coincidentally, my friend Alison, her dad is Michael Grade, whose dad was Lou Grade. No way. Just sheer fluke. Then, when I bought my first, <laughs> when I bought my first studio kit, I I literally just you know I saved up whatever I had and and I I went to there was a local music shop called Carlsboro Music it shut down years ago and um, there was a guy there called Richard who I became good mates with and he sold me my first little, little you know microphone and a little mixing desk and you know mm. the basics just to get going then he was a keyboard player. It was. It was. I used to think. I used to think I could play the piano until I met Richard, and then you realise no, Richard can play the piano. I own a piano. That was the difference, you know. And one day he said, "Well, I'll come back sometime. Let's just hang out of mine." So I went to uh, his place with, with his folks, and you walk up to this building. You go, "What is this?" Because it was this huge <laughs> building, and it said Holick and Taylor Studio on it, mm. and. I walked in and there was a recording studio downstairs. This big proper recording studio. Wow. And then editing facilities and I went upstairs <laughs> and he introduced his mum and dad to me. And said, this is Gene and this is John. And I said, You're John Taylor. He went, Yes. I said, You're Thunderbirds John Taylor, the sound designer of Thunderbirds. And he went, Yes. I said, it's so lovely to meet you. <laughs> and you go, how did that happen? So, yeah, so, um, and Rich used to get, um, you know, Jerry was Uncle Jerry. You know, Jerry Anderson was kind of Uncle Jerry to him. Mm -hmm. So, you know, he would get, like, early versions of Thunderbirds toys and, and you know, like, prototype stuff. And, like, wow. what any kid would do, you'd, you'd bash them to pieces. <laughs> and these collector's items now. But, yeah, so my heroes were... Uh, I loved the Jerry Anderson shows because, I, again, they were, they were cinematic, but the characters were great, the voice acting was great, and you totally believed it. And they're timeless. You watch those things now, and, you know, Thunderbirds has aged incredibly well. And, and now I, I work with Jamie, uh, Jamie Anderson, Jerry's son, mm. and um, on new projects. So. Thunderbirds are go, cool, right? Yeah, I'm in the I'm in the reboot of Thunderbirds. Yeah, mm. so I'm 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 Captain Wayne Rigby at your service with freshly baked on eyebrows, <laughs> and to be part of that was that that was incredible because I'm a you know again huge fan of these shows, and um, they did a uh, let me show you this thing here. So look at that fella. Wow. So they they did. They found a whole bunch of original audio stories, seven inch singles of Thunderbirds that, that were made purely as audio books. And then they basically took those and expanded them and created brand new uh, uh, footage for mm. these shows because the footage never existed because they were never meant to be shows. So um, I went and did a, a, a look around the set and, and, and saw, so I, I had a load of pictures and you know, spent the whole day there. And then not long after, I got cast in Thunderbirds I'll Go. And so the, the, the puppy you see there is Parker. Yes, my lady. Performed by the, the brilliant David Graham. And then in Thunderbirds I'll Go, I would walk in the studio and David oh, would be there man. because he was still the voice <laughs> of Parker. And wow. you know what? You know, sometimes, sometimes it's just enough to be in the room. Of course, you're working on these amazing things, but really, to be part of, of this team and, and work with these, like the best in that, that the best in, in, in that side of, of the of that world, 
is um, is amazing. So it meant the world to me to just be able to, you know, you, you'd walk in there and you'd hear, Baldy Mark. <laughs> and and you go, David knows my name. But yeah, so I, I worked on that. And then for the new uh all the new stories that have been created on, on the voice of uh, Steve Zodiac and, and for, for Fireball and then for, um, for Stingray, it's, okay, Marina, let's go, fire Sting missiles. Yeah. It's all that stuff. A big, larger-than-life raised eyebrow yeah. bits and pieces. But then you are saying about inspirations, another guy I love with this guy called Dom Messick. And these are names that people haven't heard of. Why would you? But Dom Messick was, um, I saw him, he was a guest on Blue Peter, when I was, you know, just watching this thing years ago. And this guy sat there in a sweater. And and they said, today we've got a very special guest. Tell him all about yourself. And he went, well, he said, this is Don. Tell him what you do, Don. He said, well, I'm the voice of Scooby Dooby Doo. <laughs> <laughs> my jaw hit my knees. Because you go, it's that guy. You and... don't expect that as a kid. It's crazy, isn't it? <laughs> well, you know what it's like when you see any documentary and you see what those performers actually look like, what, yeah. what the voice actors look like. I used to love that stuff. It I just, still do. Yeah. 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 How would you not be fascinated by it? It's just, it's cool. Yeah. And of course, like when, when you know, before pre-web, this was treasure because yeah. you couldn't just go online and deposit it. You know, you had to do some proper Sherlocking to find this stuff. And so not long, I mean... Oh, what would it be? 95? 95. There was an um Don Messick came over to the UK to do a signing at an art gallery. And I got to meet him. Uh, and that was that was me back when I was 12. And and then it was just absolute treasure just to be able to get to talk to the guy. Because he was the voice of Scooby, but he was often the voice of of the narrator in Hannah Barbera cartoons as well. Mm. Don Messick was also the voice of <laughs> It was the voice of Muttley. I can't really do it because he smoked. <laughs> so he had a proper smoker's wheezy cough. He was also in Yogi Bear. Don was the voice of, gee, Yogi, don't tell Ranger Smith about the picnic basket. <laughs> <laughs> so he was the voice of um, you know, loads of stuff. But yeah, so there was, there was him. Oh, so you, I mean, you, you're kind of like a spiritual successor, at least from my point of view. You, you've ended up doing a lot of the stuff that your heroes did. That's a lovely way of putting it. Thanks. And it, it's... That's a small part of what I do. I mean, it's, that's mm. like the spice, that's the icing on the cake stuff, where you just go, what yeah. a privilege that someone else has allowed you to play with this instrument. You know, like, you know, they, they designed the guitar, you can now play with it. It's not impressions you're doing. It's, I understand why people could say, think it is, but it's not. Because if you're just doing an impression, you're almost just copying what someone's done before. And if you're just copying, you need to understand why it worked in the first place. Yeah. to take it to somewhere new. It's what's interesting when I've listened to Steve Whitmire talk about Kermit. I don't know if you have as well, but he goes into extensively how working with Jim Henson, he observed how Jim acted in his day-to-day -day life. And it's that that he replicated and put into Kermit. And then the voice just kind of came second nature. There's a documentary that's, if, even if you've seen it 10 times, go and watch it again. It's called Of Muppets and Men. It starts out where you see them singing um, Beach Boys, I Get Around, and they're all on motorbikes. Then it pulls out and you see all the performers underneath the puppets. And it's it's like, you go, oh yeah. my God, look at Mind this. This is, <laughs> this is magic. It's magic. And it inspired me. It had such an impact on me, like an early age. And then to see Jim and Frank rehearsing with, with Kermit and, and Fozzie, what you realise is they're extensions of them. No matter who else performs him afterwards, it's, it, 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 will, it can still be a great performance of, of Kermit or name the character, but it won't have that heart and soul that was Jim. You can't dig into that because it isn't you. You know, there's the stuff that only you would say in your way, in your time, in your thoughts, and your sense of humour. And then someone else could try and take over the way you do it and maybe sound like you, but it's it's not you. I think and Kermit was so close to Jim's natural voice as well. People seem to, when people do impressions, they're doing overly, like, all this rubbery sound. But it was really Jim lowering his voice a bit in an hour. There's a kindness and a joy and an edge and, a, you know, there's frustration some, at times. 
Yeah, there's, there's something that only he will bring to their character. Same with Frank Oz. If you ever hear Frank Oz talk about the Muppets, they the people tend to always talk about the voice when it's the Muppets. Yeah, and he will say no, it's the it is the character. They perform the characters. They are they are. It's the whole thing. They, he'll say that the voice is just a smaller percentage of it because it's the overall. It's when you watch <laughs> anyone else. Let's say you could recreate Jim's voice perfectly. You're still going to perform it like he did. You know, the, the way that he performed that character yeah. is, it's again, that's what made that character so so special to, to live and breathe and he completely bought it. The, every, every little reaction, every little moment that, that he, he made it live. When you see these, when you, there's a bit that you see where it's Jim and Frank just rehearsing and they're talking about you know, that, that uh, in other countries, um, other people do the voice. and you know, it, They're just having fun. Even when you see them ad-libbing in the field, you know, doing test footage for the movies with some cows. It's yeah. it's Jim Henson and Frank Oz, you know, with, with Fozzie and Kermit. But it's funny. Yeah. And, you you know, that's it was it's them that make that work. And it's, there's, you know, a, a character performance in someone else's hands. It, it it won't be the same character. You might be able to copy the sound of it, but it's it's so much more than that. Yeah, it's a very interesting, unique thing I think with the Muppets because obviously, I mean, you you're the expert in in replicating voices for animation and stuff. People assume it's the same or get the try and get the closest voice match, uh, but it's obviously, as you say, uh, a lot more than that. Yeah, uh, and it's and and, and again, it's. Um, you go well. Who are those characters? What are they meant to be? And it, it's uh, um, to, to me, the Muppets at their best with the Muppet Show. That's it for me. That in the them in their home where they all just integrate and the whole thing works, and and you clearly define reasons for why those characters work and what they do. To me, that the Muppet Show was the was the best example I think I've ever seen of them come together. Because I think since it's once you've got those characters, there's different people playing them. It is a like an it's them trying to emulate what's gone before, which is different to the original performers improvising, you know, and doing what they think's funny. It's all personal taste and and you know, and I understand why you why if you're creating a new show, you might not want to retread old territory. So that you mm. know, there was Muppets Tonight and then there was the Muppets and you know, it it continues, plus the the movies. And, you know, there's, there's some great work that's been done. But in terms of my own personal favourites, I think I enjoyed the the edge, the, the variety show that was The Muppet Show. That's what I love. And if you think about it, in the same with The Simpsons at its time, everybody wanted to be on The Simpsons. You know, there's like in, in every kind of generation, there's that show that all the celebs have to be on. You, you know, you're not a celebrity unless you've been on that mm -hmm. show. And that was it. Uh, you know, you yeah, you've made it. If you're on that, if you're on that show, you have made it now. And the Muppet Show was that show, and it started off where nobody wanted to be on it, <laughs> you know. But then it was yeah. it was the go to. But I I still adore that. I, it's it's um, it's time. Have you been to the Have you been to the Jim Henson exhibition in New York? I have not. I've never been to America in my life. You have to, to go. go. It is it is tremendous. It is so much fun. I I've been every time I go. I. I just go and look around it. It's a permanent exhibition at the Museum of the Moving Image. They donated some of the stuff, right, from uh, Jim's kids, yeah? Oh, yeah, there's a lot. So there's everything from Jim Henson's original headband that he used to use for Kermit's, you know, Mike. You got bits from Sesame Street, you got the Swedish chef, you got the Muppet Show signed. It's, it's, a, it's a really great collection of classic Muppet history. And there was, when I was working on, there's a show called Go Jet as I work on. Uh, cool. Uh, and I, I play the, I play Grandmaster Glitch. I'll get you no jitters. <laughs> One of the producers on that worked for Henson. And I said to him, I'm going to New York shortly. And I know that next door to the Museum of the Moving Image uh, is Astoria Studios, which is where they film Sesame Street. And I know around the corner from that is the, is the, the workshop where they build Muppets for Sesame Street. And stuff. Can't imagine where this is going. <laughs> so I said, "Is there any way I can do the tour you can't do tour?" And I, and then an hour later, I had this email that just said, "Yes." And seriously, Jordan, I nearly I nearly burst into tears. I was it meant it meant so much 
because of I don't know why these things have such an impact on your life. But Neither do I, but you know, this is what I ask myself. But it's yeah, I, it's true. It meant something in terms of creativity. It's it's the benchmark for for that world. So I you know I I went I went there and I was just so excited just to knock on the door. And they show me around the workshop, and and there's the uh, the first thing you see as you walk in. There's a, there's a display of all the fraggles. There was a Mister Snuffleupagus, and then they <laughs> they show me around where they dye the um, dye the material. And at the very back, the very back of, of this huge space, uh, were loaded drawers, and um, the the guide showed me around. And said, "What's your favorite Sesame Street character?" And I just went, "But," and he went. <laughs> okay, and he oh, and then you start, and then I saw what was in front of me, and it was on these drawers of all these labels, and it was all the Muppets it's from Sesame it. Street, all all these characters from Sesame Street, and you just go, this is just the history of everything you adore right in front of you, right here, and wow. he opened this drawer that said Bert, and a shining light <laughs> glimmered from above, and you hear, <laughs> and then they took me to the place where they do photo shoots and this happened and it's the actual bird and you know if you're a fan of this stuff it's like you know it matters it, just, it looks so right for some reason yeah you, you can you can tell it's the actual bird i don't know how you just can you know and, and you know and, and the guy's there moving his eyebrows up and down and i'm in you know i'm in this other i felt like a lottery winner you know that's what it feels like to, to win all the scratch cards yeah. But that was that's a, a you know a great thing. I mean, yeah. So oh, the Henson stuff so special. In the same way that I adore stop motion. So again, it's more mm -hmm. puppets. And there's um, there's a show working called Fifi and the Flower Tots, and uh, and that was a gorgeous show. And that was uh, Jane Horrocks and me. Here are the actual puppets from Fifi. Oh wow! So you got um, Bumble. Yeah, Bumble and, and Slugsy, right? Bumble and Slugsy. So there's I, a, there's, I remember yep. this, sorry, because when when I was younger, my, my uh, little sister would would watch this. So so that was just on on the TV all the time. And I remember the voices now. As soon as I saw that you played them, the voices came to us. Bouncing boobies, Jordan. Fee fee, forget me not. Forgot. So the, you, you, so you got. Oh yeah. So Bumble's all bunged up because he's all allergic to pollen. Have you got a tissue, Jordan? <laughs> 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 All this stuff. And so that's Bumble there. Uh, but oh, by the way, these puppets are made by McKinnon Saunders, who are the lead, the world leaders, basically, in making stop motion puppets. They're incredible. I didn't realize they were that big. <laughs> yeah. Well, they they, they make they make the puppets for um, Tim Burton, Fantastic Mr. Fox, um, Corpus Bride, loads and loads of stuff. Uh, this is like 100 years ago we did this. And those each of those puppets... At, the, at that time, cost ten thousand pounds. Wow! So Slugsy on the right hand side, this this slug, we had to come up with a voice for the thing, and you go, well, okay, how does this slug sound? And you kind of go, okay, well, he's got a bit of a weight on him, you know, he's got a bit of timber on the fella right there on, on his tongue, <laughs> and then, so it's probably going to be quite a low fellow talking like this. And uh, I saw something on TV the day before I went down to create this character voice, and it was an old carry-on film with a British actor called Bernard Breslau, who had this great big voice like this, and he was <laughs> perpetually happy. And in this carry-on film, I heard him say something along the lines of, I said, the house just burnt down. Still, got a laugh, eh? Uh, it was like that. And I thought, that could be quite fun for that little fella right there. But then it wasn't quite right. So I thought, well, what's missing that a slug has that this doesn't have? And we realised moisture. So I added some moisture to him, and we realised Slugsy is lovable, huggable, and a bit damp. And he's one of the favourite characters voices that I think I've ever created for things because he's so versatile. <laughs> There's so much to him. So he can be lovely and huggable and vulnerable. I think uh, Primrose doesn't like me. I smell of cabbage, you know this thing. And then suddenly he'll go for that. Oh, good idea! Stay down, you know, and and completely. He belt it. Yeah. It's so wonderful how that came together from just the odd bits. And then all <laughs> these years later, like I, I remember that. That's like hearing an old friend or something. That's which is weird. That's that, weird. Well, that's so nice for you to say because I, I feel I've got 
I've got real fondness for characters I grew up with. So I, you know, I love the voice of Brian Kant on Campbell Green and Chigley and Trumpton and you know oh, Oliver yeah. Postgate's <laughs> gentle voice for for Bagpuss and then David Jason and and uh, uh, you know for Danger Mouse and all these you know, all these other bits and pieces. For, 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 but for you to still enjoy that now, it's really lovely. And then when I was working on that, well, that was Jane Horrocks and me. And they come for the you know, brilliant voice actors, and then we did Rory the Racing Car with Peter Kay and me. Oh yeah, and um, that oh that was you know we had a lot of fun. We had a lot of fun, you know. It was, you just, jammy we, bugger. Yeah, well, you know, we I mean, lots of stories. There, there was, we, <laughs> Please we do tell. Like, well, we both well we both like Billy Joel. And so one day he invited me to go and see Billy Joel with him, and that was an amazing experience. I got to, I, we went via the artist entrance backstage, and the band's just all lined up there. It's very rare my legs turn to jelly, but but you know it was one of those moments. It, it gives us you know they were all there, and we got to meet them, and we had dinner before the show, and over there lemon meringue, you know. And then we had bet we were ushered to our seats, and we had better seats than Cameron Diaz. Wow! How has this day happened? I, I don't and know, Mark. It, how have you done it? <laughs> that was astonishing. And then, also, if you watch, you you've seen the five hundred miles video. The oh PTK yes, did yeah. With, yeah. with all this, you know, it, it was a charity video for, for with a load yeah. of celebs in. I love his charity stuff so much. Those collaboration things which yeah yeah me too well at the end of that video uh he invited me to go and just hang out on the day so I, i'm there through the whole shoot of this wow. video and then you know you get to, you get to meet basil brush and dusty <laughs> bin and you know shawadi wadi and david tennant and all these you know extremes oh, come on but then at the end of it he said do you want he said do you want to be in the video I went, yeah he said quick get a wardrobe get a tuxedo so i rushed out got Wait, you're in the video I'm in the video. So if you watch the 500 miles video, at the end, I think I've still got my jeans on, there is a shot where it pans out. It's the longest shot, probably the whole video. And you see me dancing with Bucks Fizz and David <laughs> Bellamy. <laughs> and the camera pulls back and we go, I would walk 500 miles. You know, it was, wow. yeah, it was very exciting. I was looking over that stuff for when I did like it video on PDK and the history and stuff. I love this stuff like that because it doesn't seem to happen now. I'm very glad that I was able to, you know, share that. And then after Rory, well, around the time we're doing that, there was, I I was doing, um, I was I was the narrator on Pingu. Yes. So I was wearing all, as, as well as all the, new, new, that's about your Pingu that you'd hear. They did about, was it about 100 shorts that they, the BBC mm. did? And again, um, pub, um, models by McKinnon Saunders again. But it was my voice that you'd hear, Hello, Pingu. What's that, Pingu? In an igloo? Oh, Pingu. And we were recording this, and I, I would enjoy, before and after me recording my voice tracks, just going around the studio, because the, the audio studio was in the same place they actually did the animation. So I've got all these behind the scenes photos of of you know Pingu and the sets and the whale and wow. you know and just to see how all these stop motion things were done. And while I was recording these, um, a producer came into the room and, that I knew that said, "If you were to be the voice of a builder called Bob, that was American, how would that sound?" I said like. Uh, Come on, guys, let's go. Gotta, we got to build a bridge. Union rules, let's hustle. And, and, <laughs> and they said, well, <laughs> something maybe less angry. Uh, so I, I said, well, how about, hi, today we're going to build a house. <laughs> and they said, well, maybe somewhere in the middle. <laughs> let's build yeah. a house. And, and somewhere in the middle. And so I, I, I said, well, how about, hi, Bob the Builder here. Can we fix it? Yes, we can. Come on, Wendy, let's go. Today we're going to build a concrete bridge, which is a real practical skill for a five-year-old, right? And that stuff. <laughs> and, uh, and then they said, yeah. And I ended up, they'd, um, yeah. there'd been two voices before me. There's a guy called um, uh, William, uh, Bill DeVries. And then there was Greg Proops, who I loved from Whose Lies Anyway. And then they were doing this um, changeover of the whole structure of the show. And I ended up being the voice of Bob for, I think it was nearly a decade. 
And wow. um, I started when it was still stop motion. Oh, I was just going to ask that because I love like that's when I remember it. It was obviously it it was the UK voice, but the the stop motion and that, yeah. Yeah, because Neil was the vo- Neil Morris was the voice of Bob in the UK, mm. but then I, I became the voice of him for um, at the at the end of the last sort of season or so of him being stop motion. Then they did CGI tests, which originally actually looked pretty good, and then um, I, I I took my mom to New York because uh, Hit <laughs> Entertainment was in, on Park Avenue, I think it was, and so I I, I went out there and I took my mom there, and we were. I was, you know, it's like you visit somewhere that you're excited about and it's a thrill. It's a privilege to be there. But the thing I hadn't thought of was they were excited that the voice of Bob was coming to see them. (laughs) So we were treated so nicely and they were so kind. And they showed me, you know, their their rooftop office where you see the Chrysler building from the, yeah, this is pretty good. But but working on that was, it was pretty great because we did it for a, a, you know, it was a really good run of Bob. And the thing that's unusual, it's one of those where you I never really got to see just how popular it was with, with me being part of it. Because you know, in the kind of, US, right? Exactly that, yeah. And then and then the the first time I really appreciated just um you know, the impact that what it was you were doing, what you know, mm. as part of this collaboration being the voice of Bob was having was I did um uh, I, I I worked on Star Wars uh, with with George Lucas. Oh, just drop that one in. That guy so, in the uh, corner, right? <laughs> that guy in the corner. Yeah, there. He's so yeah, so the guy in the corner here, <laughs> him. Uh, there you go. That guy. So the voice of that guy in Star Wars Episode One. Uh, so when he comes on screen, you'll hear the Congress of Malastare concur with the right to honourable delegate for the Trade Federation. A commission must be appointed now. Where's Jordan? It was that's exactly what he said. <laughs> um, but but that guy there, and um, and I was fortunate enough. And again, I was a huge Star Wars fan, and I think if uh, and so to work with George Lucas, that was at Abbey Road Studios. And that was the that was the second film I I got to work on. The first was Chicken Run. Yes, that. <laughs> and, and so to get to work with him, you go. It was a really great start. Oh, How and, did the Star Wars thing happen? Well, pretty early on, I, I was getting a, a a good reputation for being versatile and focusing on on characters rather than just voiceovers, because. It, this is it's just what I loved, and my influence, my my heroes and influences were from all these different worlds. So, they I was put forward as someone that might be a good fit, and I got a phone call saying, "Would you be free to meet up with the casting director of a brand new Star Wars film on Tuesday?" I said, uh, "Let me just check." Yes, <laughs> it kind of changed my life really because it just it's one of those things where you go. Um, so much of this is about trust, and if you were okay for. George Lucas, you might be okay for us. And it opened a lot of doors. Uh, one of them, uh, one of them was, uh, I, I, again, word went around that I, I also love the, the, the music of John Williams, you know, just the mm. soundtrack, like with the Muppets, like with Henson, like all these names we've talked about and adore, it's part of the fabric of, of, of what we, massively what us. influential, yeah. The soundtrack of John Williams, in, across all these movies is huge. And so I got asked to host a Star Wars symphony. Uh, and with it was a Star Wars symphony with the Royal Philharmonic Orchestra and myself live at the Royal Albert Hall. And that there's God a picture damn. of it back when I was purple. <laughs> it was a blue, what do you reckon? But yeah, so that was, we had 5,000 people there. We did two shows and we're doing it again was that terrifying to do or are you at a point where you're quite confident in it you know standing in front of five thousand people that that here's the truth of it i when i started i was pretty shy really i i wanted to be the but i didn't want to be on a screen i wanted to be i yeah there you go much better um i didn't want to be on a screen i wanted to be the just get my i wanted to be the creative guy with my head down, pressing the buttons, recording, producing other people. That was it. Mm. And then I started doing bits of work because I knew I could do it. But it's just like, you know, when you're starting out creatively to sh- show other people your work, 
it, it takes a leap of confidence to do that. You know, the first time you showed somebody a video of what you do, it takes a little bit of guts because you go, isn't this great? And some yeah. might go, no, <laughs> it's not. What I wanted to do was create a show. And as part of the show, it means that, yes, I am in front of people. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's like well, with what we're doing. It's the nature. We're just having a chat. It's this. It might be seen by many people. But what was lovely for me, and I wasn't expecting this, was um, I don't I don't assume people will know my my name. Um, people mm -hmm. more and more people tend to now at Comic Cons and things, which is very nice. But it's one of those where you keep your feet on the ground and then you might have some nice surprises come your way. The, the show started with the 20th Century Fox Overture. The bum 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 you know that. Dun -dun -dun. And then, bam, the Star Wars thing starts, the main title. And then that ends, the crowd go nuts, and then the, the announcer guy, which wasn't me for a change, said, he, he introduced me. And he introduced me by saying, you've heard him in this, you've heard him in that, you've seen him in that. And what was, I was in the, on the wings, I was ready to go out. And you heard, he's the voice of Bob the Builder in the USA. And you heard, oh, he's the voice of, of you know, Captain Wayne Rigby in Thunderbirds I'll Go. Every time they said a name, the crowd kind of got more and more enthusiastic. And he worked alongside George Lucas, creating characters for Star Wars Episode One. Please welcome this person. And I walked out and, and they went absolutely bonkers, which was... <laughs> I, didn't, I expected polite applause. That must have been a defining moment, surely, in your career, for, that, for all that to come together, you know? Yeah, and especially my mom was in the box at the back of the thing. <laughs> and, and even down to before the apocalypse, before the pandemic, I'd go and visit the children's hospital a few times a year. And Honey would come Honey would come with me. She's fast asleep, my little pup right there. And um, there was a guy uh, called Luan who I, I met there at the children's hospital and he was on a 24 hour care. He couldn't talk. He was on a you know, full on oxygen, the whole thing. And he came up to me at this just event that I was at at the children's hospital um, with his lightsaber. And, and we, you know, even though he couldn't actually talk, we had a conversation and I spoke with him and I'm, I said, you're getting everything. Yeah, so I, every, and all it didn't want any of the other stuff. It was just Star Wars stuff he wanted, but it was this really cool guy that you know it, that liked his that loved his lightsaber and loved Star Wars and wanted to say hi, and that meant a lot to me. And then when I found out that we were doing this event at the Royal Albert Hall, I got in touch with the the head of um, the Rare Diseases Unit at the Children's Hospital. I said, look, I'm doing this thing. I've cleared it with the Royal Albert Hall. I've cleared it with the Royal Philharmonic Orchestra. If there's one person that should be there. It's him. How do we do that? And they, they were kind enough to put a special team on and we we got him there. And being able to do stuff like that every it's now amazing. and then. Yeah. Well, the, it's the stuff that matters because, you know, th I, I, I went through something when I was, you know, um, 18, 16, 18. And I know what it meant to me when somebody reached out and helped me. You know, I, I, I had a year off. And, um, you know, I'm good now. And th the idea that if there's something I can do within the work that I get up to that can, you know, that someone get a kick out of, that can make the day yeah. a bit better, that's a nice thing to be able to do. Yeah. And, and he went there and it was, you know, we, we lost him a few years later. You know, I followed his story, but it was, his mom was nice enough to say it was the, the, the most exciting day he'd ever had. And that meant oh. a lot. So to you know to just be able to be part of that is it's lovely. There's one other thing that again almost connects back to the Bob the Builder thing. Do you know Tops Cards, the collectible card people in yes. America? They do loads and loads of really collectible stuff. Well, they got in touch with me saying they they were going to do and they wanted to do an, a, a collectible Axmo, my name, Mark <laughs> Silk trading card. Yeah. Yeah, and you go, are you kidding me? So I went out to New York and I, I did this um, I did this signature session with them at Tops Cards. It's quite incredible. But the guy that um, that was the head of the place, he heard that I did, you know, a number of voices, a number of characters, loads of them. And he said, um, and he said, like, like, who else? And I gave him this list, you know, and this fly, and, and he said, okay. He said, Bob the Builder? And he, and he went, and then he went, and he went, oh my, 
<laughs> and, he, and he swore like crazy. He said, I'm sorry. To, he said, you're the Bob the Builder? Are you kidding me? You're Bob the Builder? He said, my son's favorite show is Bob the Builder. We're having construction work done at our home. Each night he waves goodnight to Roly. It's safe to say it's big in America then. I wasn't sure, you know, how big it was there. So clearly it is. <laughs> I, I do a lot of comic cons and you know, signings and things like that, and I, I enjoy just meeting other people that like the same stuff I do. You know, but also a lot of the people that are signing there, you get to make friends with people that you'd never even normally bump into. You'd never, you, you'd never normally even be in the room with. You know, it's just you know, it, you know we're chatting because we like the same stuff. It's that's nice to meet some of these other people. There's you know, other voice actors and things. I mean, there's didn't you. You met Charles Martin there, right? Woo! There you go. Hold yeah. it. <laughs> that that was a particularly is is that baked bean for lasagna? It was it was <laughs> lasagna. It was okay. The food was okay. Yeah, I think. <laughs> yeah. Woo! Yeah. No, Charles is great. It was so. I when I do comic cons, I bump into Charles regularly. He's one of those people I love hear and talk for a while because you know the character of mario it's wahoo it's so simple on the surface yep. but then when he yep. talks about the character and why he plays it in that way you go on for hours oh yeah absolutely yeah he's um he's a really lovely guy and if you ever see him if you ever see him at a comic-con well even if you don't see him you'll hear him because he <laughs> tends to have a, a very loud bluetooth speaker <laughs> playing playing mario tracks <laughs> um, but then there's a guy who's uh, again up there with as good as it ever gets uh uh kevin conroy so mm. you know, he and he was you know he was the voice of batman he you know he it's basically him and um i had coffee with him last oh, was it april last year um at a, at a comic con and we just you know so I, I i'd only met him a few times before but we we're just having coffee just catching up before the comic con started I think it was, we're chatting about a lamp that he had, this really cool, like, sculptured <laughs> lamp that was really you know, been given to him as a gift. And I thought it'd be, I thought we should get a picture of each other because he was just, you know, such a cool guy. And I thought, no, we'll just do it next time. And then not long after, we lost him. I remember that, yeah. And it was just, it was heartbreaking because he's such, it was such a lovely man. And, and as a performer, you know, what a voice, but what an actor. And I, I'd met him years before that, just after he started, big, started as the voice of Batman for the animated series. And it was, it was at, I think it was called Collector Mania in Birmingham. It was a, like an early comic con in, in Birmingham in the UK. And um, he was there with an animation art gallery and they had all this Batman art, but he was just sat there and not not shown off as it's Kevin Con. You know, <laughs> it was just it was just this guy there. And we, and we got chatty and he said, he said, Mark, great to meet you. He said, these guys, they're all crackers. <laughs> he said, people keep coming up to me complaining about storylines, you know, and then and we, he said, look, I have I've, I've collected a, 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 a I said, I've collected notes with all their comments. And he got this little book and he'd written all the loopy <laughs> comments people had made to him at the comic Con. But he, there was a flyer they had there of, of these characters. And I said to him, um, I said, you got to sign this for me. Will you just sign this for me, please? He said, sure. <laughs> and he signed this and he, and he wrote, to Mark, from one great voice to another, Kevin Conroy. Batman. Wow. And you go, oh my God. <laughs> so just to have that was lovely. But but spending time with some of these people is um is it means a lot. It's so sad when that happens as well, because you always feel a deep connection with these people when they pass on. It's sad. And with the, the Mario thing recently, is Charles has just stepped down hmm. for Mario. Yeah. So that's that's depressing to me, but um it's in a way nice that Charles is still with us, and it's a yeah, a a pleasant sort of leaving, not not something controversial. Yeah, and, and of course, you know, the the movie Chris Pratt was the voice of of Mario, and that was kind of there was a lot of con controversy over that whether you know was that the right decision because you know Charles is Mario, and the, the I think the feeling at the at the beginning the, the sentiment was that the movie won't work because it's not the right voice of Mario. And then it went on to be this humongous success. Massive, yeah. 
Yeah, I remember so... thinking at the time I was able to separate them, as in mm. because he looked a bit different, and it was I thought, oh well, this is movie Mario. At least we've yeah. still got Charles for the game's book. And if you, yeah, and Charles's work, you know, it's he defined that role. If you ever get the chance to meet Charles, do because he's, he's a I would guy. believe me if he comes to the UK at all. I wasn't aware he even. Yeah, I mean, I, I, yeah, I've, I've I've like just hung out with him a number of times. He's a he's a he's a very personal person. But there's but these these things are you know these like playing Mario. It, even though they're little spot vocal moments, because you know initially there wasn't enough memory to put much in there. Yeah. But they, they become they become such an important part of your gameplay experience. And there's I mean the very first the very first game I ever did well one of them was for Nintendo sixty four for N sixty four. Wow. It was a game called Fighters Destiny, and they had no space for voices. So all you heard from me was. Player one, fight. Player two, fight. Game over. And that was it. And because I couldn't fit anything else in. But that but I was so excited because you got a real you got a cartridge. So you're in a cartridge. It's not like a bit a tape or a physical CD. media, isn't it? Yeah. Physical <laughs> media, Jordan. That's what it's all about. And then going all the way, you know, and then through games. Um I've been really fortunate to be part of some really cool games. I worked on a game called Black and White around 2000, and it was a huge game. And it was one of the very first games where you could, you know, basically walk all around this world. And there were two main characters. There was the voice of good and the voice of evil. So I was the voice of good and the voice of evil. Yeah, totally, total red bag. These two things. And... Part of that team went on to create this thing called um, Two Point Hospital. When you're playing this game, there are three radio presenters across the day mm. when you play the game. Are you and all of them? I am them, yes. <laughs> and, and so the the first, and again, you, you gotta you gotta figure these voices out. You have to create them out of nothing. You know, when you're starting, you know, just casting them, you know, casting these characters. And so the first, the first presenter, the first DJ, they wanted him to be perpetually happy. I coincidentally had just been on hold with someone trying to sort out my internet. It was rubbish. The provider was just rubbish. Uh, but the person they had, that their call centre was, they were Scottish. And and she was completely happy about everything. Don't worry, sir. We'll we'll completely look after you and give you a package that's suitable for you. And and it just, I thought. Oh, I feel fine about everything. I'll just I'll do anything she says. She says lovely, yeah. you know, And I thought, well, a Scottish, a, a perpetually happy Scottish, uh, Scottish person would be nice then. So, we've done this guy called Ricky Hawthorne in the morning. Good morning. And it doesn't matter what's going on. He's very, very over the moon. And then, uh, as the game progresses, you get to speak to Sir Nigel Bickleworth, who sees anyone other than myself as abject scum. <laughs> you know, yeah. and now Sir Nigel reviews. It was dreadful. You know, so there's him, and then in the evening there's Harrison Wolf. He's the conspiracy guy. Seriously, man, aliens. They're real, Jordan. I have the evidence. Don't mess with me, man. I have proof, and I will show you. And if I can't find the proof, I'll make up the proof. So he's he's very intense. But um, I would never the, have even guessed that they were all you. I can guarantee if I, you know, without knowing. Well, uh, well, here's well, here's the thing. There's um, th there's there's a whole bunch of stuff that I think people probably wouldn't know as me. So about hundred years ago, I was working doing little bits and, and pieces for a station in Dublin called FM One Hundred Four, and it's uh, uh, this Irish radio station. It's a very cool, big station in Dublin. And, you know, they, they, I just asked them what they're up to and they said, well, they're looking for the voice of their radio station, the voice. It's that one, that, you know, the, it's the one that sounds like a movie trailer that does all the eye dance and stuff. And then a couple of months later, I, I just said, how's, it, how's the search for the voice going? Because, uh, you know, it was this Irish-American thing they're after. And it said, terrible. It said, we've tried DJs, local people, we've tried competition winners, <laughs> actors, we can't find anyone, nothing. And I just said, well, what is it you're after? He said, well, like what you do, but it has to be like the vibe of the station, you know, like Irish-American kind of stuff. 
I said, well, like Dublin's at Music Station, FM 104, your chance to win 20,000 euro. And he went, oh, crap, you could have saved me three months. <laughs> that was, uh, and I can't quite believe it, 20 years ago. I've been the voice of this radio station for 20 years. Oh, so you're still doing it now. Wow. I, I, I do a recording session with them every week. And it, it's, it's incredible because those gigs very rarely happen. I don't know. I, I can't think. I'm trying to think of a, of a voice that's kind of sustained that length on a radio station. Because normally when you get new people in, they'll change it over or have their idea of, you know, new branding or new logos. But the thing that's been, take take me out of it personally. But the thing that's been great with this, with this particular voice or performance or, you know, this gig, um, when you the, when you hear that voice in Dublin, it doesn't even need to say FM 104. But you know it's FM 104. Yeah. Just hearing that, you know it's that station. That's right, because I think voices that people do subconsciously just have them in their minds all the time. So like you say, they hear you and they, they know what it is. Yeah. I, and and that's been it's a real it's a it's a lovely compliment but and i'm over the you know i'm very grateful for the for the fact, for the fact that this job has lasted that long but it's what was the thing that i'm really proud of is it wasn't just my voice we created a character for it and i think if you heard it you wouldn't know it's me that's even more interesting yeah the for a radio station you went out of your way to to do that yeah because to me, it's it's all it's all characters, it's all performance. You you know when you go the magical world of Disney, you know, welcome. It, that's a performance. It's it's this elevated, larger than life way of saying those words. And so for me, for FM one hundred and four, it was well, what is the character of the station? It's kind of mainly in this American push, but with this kind of slightly. Irish thing there too, but it's like Only Murders in the Building season three now streaming on net on Disney Plus on Netflix on something else. <laughs> it's all this, you know, and you go, well, that's kind of cool. It's almost like that that movie trailer voice you've known for years. Now back to the music. You were totally like when I first heard your usual, um, you know, presenting voice. It um, it has that just deep, rich. Quality. I was unsure about how much of that was like the microphone and how much of it was you. Hang on. If I take that off, it's a lot thinner. So mostly, really, it, just me talking normally is more like this, really. There's, there's, the whole thing is processed. So me normally is sort of slightly shy. Bit of an accent and, as well. Yes, a bit, bit of that as well. Yes, exactly that. Yeah. It's brilliant. Yeah. So there's, there's that. But um, it works uh, well, though. What my, what my normal voice? No, it, no as in, <laughs> you should turn up one day and just do that. Don't um, just do that voice there for the radio. That one, yes. Yes. Yeah, your chance to win twenty thousand pounds. <laughs> How exciting! You know, it's all that. But again, even that, I don't think I've done that. that particular, I need to use this for something. So the the, the idea, of, especially when he's slightly off microphone. This is so on. This is so on my. So if you got something that's a bit more, so okay. So don't be nervous. And three, two, one, go. Now get ready for action and adventure. No, do it again. Sorry. So nervous. No. Okay, so here you go, take three, three, two, one, go. Now, get ready for Jordan live. You know, it's all this kind of thing. <laughs> that is crackers. It shows that it's a directional microphone, but yeah, wow. But e even again, just mic technique. So if you're doing, th there's a lot of the time in animation, you'll be performing with yourself, or, or at least I can do. So some people like to record character by character. By character. Others like to because then it's all it's all consistent then especially especially if you're starting out if you're doing a new show and you don't really even still know what the character sounds like yet you're you're you know I'm I'm still learning the tune sometimes what what is a healthy way of doing it is performing character by character but say Fifi and Rory and a lot of these other shows we've done as a cast so you perform them live as a, like a like a radio show really which, is great. which then is edited down i was going to ask about that yeah because you mentioned because working with peter on on rory and stuff so i assumed mm. you must have been in the same vicinity when you were doing that yes yeah, so it'd be peter and myself and then um the other members of the cast 
and then uh, and every now and then we'd you know we'd have like the guests. So the the narrator was Sterling Moss, mm. you know, the racing legend, <laughs> and then the other then every now and then we had Murray Walker, the 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 the, um, the commentating legend as well. <laughs> Murray Walker, he would come in, and so one of my characters, Flash the Rabbit, who's a right little tinker, he he talk about he wants you to be a commentator like Mr. Murray. That the interaction between Murray Walker and and Flash the Rabbit me was quite ridiculous. It was very funny. There's something about that show on, on retrospect because, funnily enough, as me sister used to watch Fifi, it was me brothers that would watch Rory. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. It's, yeah. it's something where you look back and it's um you know that that's got that stop motion charm of everything, and I suppose the comedy felt real from Peter to your stuff and how the characters yeah. bounced off each other. And now yeah. they had the actual commentators and stuff. Yeah. And it makes sense now that you mention it. It was very authentic, the whole, the way mm. it was done. What It just felt like, it, it, it just fell off the page really nicely. It, it was, and, the, and we had a stack of fun in the recording sessions. And I think it comes across when you watch the shows. There's, um, I've got, I've got a whole bunch of outtakes that I don't think anyone's ever hearing, <laughs> but it was it was it was very funny, and the animation's great. So the the animation again models made by McKinnon Saunders, who, who did fantastic Mr. Fox and stacks of others in terms of the animation puppets, but the animation was done by the team over at Cosgrove Hall, who were the people behind Wind of the Willows and Danger Mouse and Duckula mm. and all those amazing shows. So the the standard of the animation was. It was world class, really, but it was for kids' TV. We were very fortunate because for Fifi and Rory, we recorded those at Soho Square Studios in Soho in London. And they, uh, every t- they, I think uh, they might be my favourite studio. I can't say that. <laughs> they might be that. It's one of those places where when you go to them, you feel like you're, you're home. The people that run it, there's Kim Goody, who used to be on uh, TV as a presenter, and, a, and she's a great singer. And Alan, the uh, the you know, the other guy that owns the place, um, he used to be in the Hollies, and so you know the music they would write the theme tunes, and it's just this great collaboration where it all comes the together. The bloody earworms as well when I because I ended up looking at the stuff, and I'm like, yeah, I remember all that music. When you mentioned the the stop motion puppets and stuff, it reminded us of you know the the animated All Star Band. Were you a part of that? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. as well so did that come about i imagine with peter on the like whilst you were doing rory yeah did you because you got a good memory well i remember that was one of our favorite things we had it recorded on the skybox and just used to play it over and over again because it was a joy to watch it was a, a kid's sort of dream seeing them all together. yeah so it was all your favorite puppets stop motion all in one space singing this song and the very few times where that ever happens. It was like the we are the world for animation and puppets. And so I was brought in to perform the characters that I was the the voice of, for, I think Fifi and Rory and those. I remember also being the voice, and you won't hear it. You can't hear it in the mix. I'm pretty sure I was the voice of Brains from Thunderbirds. Maybe... Maybe Parker, because David was a voice of Brains and Parker. And I think there was something else that was a voice of. There, there, were, there were a few that they that I ended up seeing. I mean, there's plenty. With. It's so crazy every time you, you look at it. You've got the, the Thunderbirds and the old, um, what's it called? The Chippy Minton. Oh, yeah, Camboy Green. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was so mental because as I was watching it with my dad, we recognised all these new characters and then I went, well, who's that? And he goes, oh... That's a story. Yeah, well, Campbell Green, Chigley, and Trumpton, all the all, they were legendary at the yeah. time. I know all of them now. It's, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I, I loved those shows, and it was, it, yeah, and again, stop motion. And there's 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 something about all these shows that we've said that we love. You know, from from Muppets to um, Rory and Fifi, and these there's there's something wonderful with with stop motion and puppets where it's tangible it's tactile you you see it and you know that it actually exists or it existed you can you there's a there's a there's something about practical effects and stop motion animation and puppets where i think there's there's you connect with it in a way that you don't with cgi 
and it, it, it like with with Campbell Green, it is so simple. It's so basic the animation. Same with Bagpuss. Mm-hmm. You know, it is so limited in terms of the animation style, but it is so endearing because of that. They used to um, come on. I remember late night on one of the channels when I was younger. There was a thing where they go. I don't know if it was after eight o'clock, they go, now the classics. And it used to be quite scary because you'd have all this old music would come on, then you'd oh, have Cambo with Green yeah. and Bagpost. But I ended up sort of appreciating them by the end. I, I look at what's around this room and there's I, there's a there's a Kermit over here. Just believe me. <laughs> hang, hang on, man. Hang Mine's on. There. Hang on. <laughs> hang on. So, yeah, so we've got a Kermit that's, 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 and just, you know, there you go. There's that. That's been another thing that's been quite incredible. There's so... Uh, but in 2007, I got brought in to be the voice of the sorting hat for a for a toy. And it was meant to be, just be a short-term thing where you go, well, how lovely. I'm the voice of this thing. And it turned out that they they liked what I did. And so since then, if you buy a piece of sorting hat merchandise for the last over a decade, it's probably me in it. Wow. So if you... Uh, have you have you got a build a bear workshop near you? Oh yes, we do. <laughs> okay, if you go to build a bear workshop, hang on. <clears throat> you can get a sorting hat to build a bear. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can do a Harry Potter build a bear. And here he is, that handsome fella. And if you press the little button here. This, I got a friend in Utah that, that got in touch with me to say um, uh, he just bought this thing for, for his wife from Hallmark. He said, it's the kind of thing you probably like, not knowing it was me. <laughs> but this thing is, it's very clever. So here. Cunning, shrewd. Mm, let's see. Slytherin. Yes, Jordan, let's see. So if you go to the... Wizarding World of Harry Potter or Universal Studios in Hollywood or Orlando or um, possibly Japan, and you, you come out of the right, you go to the gift shop, you will find yourself being able to treat yourself to something with my voice in. Wow. If you go, I went out to the, oh, you're like this. <clears throat> that must be so weird. Or is it normal now <laughs> to hear yourself all the time? Well, it's it, it's always um, an, a, you know, a, a nice feeling to know that they enjoy what you've done. Do they want you to be? You know, they want to use what you've what, you, what you've um, performed. I also went to the uh, the Warner Brothers, the Warner Brothers Backlot tour in Burbank, you know, just outside of Hollywood. And again, very exciting. You go around, you know, you, you go around the streets. You see the, the little staircase that you see at the beginning of Gremlins. You see the uh, you know, stuff from Batman, and the, you see the costume tour, and there's the you know a lot of you, you, there are a set from Friends and Big Bang Theory and all that. And at the end of it, there's this really lovely set where you meet the Sorting Hat, <laughs> and and what was it was very funny because. That these people I'd sat next to, as we got closer to this Harry Potter bit, now and I, and I hadn't said anything to anyone. Um, this, this woman says, "Excuse me, there's a whisper going around that you're the voice of the Sorting Hat. Is that true?" Oh, would they know? <laughs> yeah, and so I denied it totally as the voice of the Sorting Hat. Went, well, let's see. It seems highly unlikely. <laughs> and then, and then. We get closer to it, and you just hear my voice like belting out of these speakers, and it, and then as soon as that happened, it was a lot of fun because a lot of people wanted photos and you know bits and pieces, and so you know we shared that moment, and then um, and then I got sorted by myself. And you, if you go there now, you'll hear Charles Martinet's voice because he's in uh, the oh, Super yeah. Mario, Super Nintendo World, yeah, Super Nintendo World. I mean, even down to you know some of the like an, another show I grew up with that was influential was Danger Mouse. Mm. Huge Danger Mouse was hugely influential, and you know, and you got and, to do stuff in that, yeah. Yeah, there was uh, there was another show I was working on, and the the head of the BBC at the time, well, no, head of children's BBC at the time, I was at some event, and she was there, and she she was great, and, and I just said, look, I've heard this rumor that Danger Mouse is going to be rebooted. I said, look, is there any way, if there's any way, that I can be part of this? I said. Please, I whatever it is, just please. Just, I will. I would love to be part of that. It would mean so much. And she went, "Yeah, no, just uh, all right. Leave it to me. I oh, know." 
And then within weeks, that happened. So, wow. So I got brought in as the voice of Nero for Danger Mouse. So, uh, so Baron Greenback's evil caterpillar. So we, st we started off with all the... <laughs> as he moves around and finding out how he, sp how he spoke and what his language should be and all these bonkers noises. But then in the end, I ended up being the voice of... It was for, um, for for the reboot of Danger Mouse. I ended up being the voice of... Th it was 31 characters for the first series in the end. Wow. But to, to be part of that again was... was quite amazing i mean on the second series i did an extra 12 characters i think it's cool that you've not only worked on stuff that you've you know that you really loved but then it's like it's reboots of those things that are that have that same kind of love behind them yeah there were these shows that were so influential to me and meant such a part of that they're re really special to me i'm very fond of these like the, the you know, muppet stuff and uh, the, the you know warner brothers shows and cosgrove hall all these things they're all part of the fabric of what um ends up being influential to you but then ends up after so long you end up finding your own voice so you're creating your own stuff and it's yours now these are your tunes your songs your ideas and you take that forward in your own way but they're still, but they're still there as massively influential. I mean, I remember when um, when Jim Henson died, I was in bits. There, there was. Did you, have you seen um, a tribute to Jim Henson, the the TV special? Yes, I have seen that one where um, all of the characters gather. They go through the story of Muppets, and then about two thirds of the way through it, you actually see some footage of the history of Jim yeah. Henson. It's very cleverly done, I thought, because oh, it's so good. The way it's they're like, oh, where's Kermit? And then he it comes in. It's sort of this slightly self-aware thing. And yeah, yeah, yeah he cool. comes in. Yeah, and then I, I'm guessing that was the first time we heard. Was that the first time we heard Steve Whitmire as Kermit? It will have been, yeah. Because the um, I met Steve Whitmire. I, I had a really good chat with Steve. Because um, how did we not talk about this? But so I don't um, know. <laughs> yeah. So for for a good couple of years, I was the voice of Anton Dick's Saturday Night Takeaway. Oh. I'll have heard you're on that too, yeah. Yeah, so big Saturday night show on UK TV, and I was that announcer guy. So it was, it's at a deck Saturday night takeaway. It was all this, and now, you know, tonight's special guests, Kylie Minogue and Kermit the Frog. You know, and this thing. And now, please welcome Jordan Scott. It was all this stuff. So it was that for a good few years. And on the finale of on the, the season, the last show of the season, the special guest was Kylie Minogue and the surprise guest was Kermit the Frog. Now, <laughs> all I really wanted to see was Kermit the Frog. <laughs> so I was there. I, I was there and, you know, Kylie's there and she was fabulous and lovely. But then for me, it was all eyes on Steve Whitmire to see how he did this. Because mm. to see him, I'd seen documentaries and seen footage, but to see him yeah. perform it li live on TV... This was actually live on TV. Which is crazy. Yeah. So, the, the, you know, the, the, the confidence and the ability, the talent it takes to do that and everything coming together was quite remarkable. So, the, and what happened was they hadn't rehearsed with, with Steve. It was a genuine surprise. And then, you know, the curtain opens and it's come with a frog. And, and he, you know, you, you see him, you know, um, you, you see him moving around them, performing Kermit. And then what happened is very quickly, the camera turned to Anton Deck. It, it cut to Anton Deck. And then there was somebody that even I didn't see. I was watching Steve the whole time with, with, that had a bag nearby. And I didn't even notice them. And this bag, suddenly Steve went, whoosh, Kermit went off and... and whoosh, and the camera goes back and it's Kermit as a blues brother. Wow. So it looks like he's That's just fascinating. changed. It was, From behind the scenes, wow. It was seconds. Yeah, it was seconds. So then, so then Steve then, he's, he's, he's quickly moved around. He, he's with them. And then, and then he moves around and like hides in a box, like an amplifier, I think it was. And you go, imagine the shoulder injuries that you must have after, after so many years of doing this. But And they sang everybody... Yeah, everyone, everybody needs somebody to love the Blues Brothers track, and it was it was completely fascinating to just see the process of yeah. how that came around. But for because it's not like you could cut and reset and try again, or if if there was anything you know if the eye line was was wrong, you know that, that you have you have to start again. But it, it was perfect. And then there was the after show party, 
upstairs and you know everyone wanted to, to either meet Kylie or, or Anton Deck. But there was this guy that just looked like a you know a, a biker like guy with like <laughs> like long hair in the corner that no one was speaking to because oh. uh, you know I, who knows because we they wanted to see Kermit but there's just this guy in the corner you know mm -hmm. and and to me it was um it was really exciting to, to meet him and just chat with him. And we had a really good chat and, and, I, and I, uh, I, I just said to him, you know, how many shoulder injuries do you have now? <laughs> and he said, well, he said, it was something like, something like Dave Goals with his, you know, cup rotation and all this kind of stuff. And it, but it was so nice to actually get a chance to meet and chat. But again, he was, he was such a good Kermit. I liked his Kermit. I did. It's hard now because when I was born, he was Kermit. But then for me, Muppet Show Jim. Yeah, you know, it's all it's all relative. It's all it's all, whatever you know, whatever's right for you. It's like have you seen, like um, you know when you see a cartoon rebooted, and you go no no it's yeah. no wrong <laughs> it's so wrong and the voices are wrong and you go no it's wrong it's not no it's not like it it's not like oh it. yeah no. totally we've all been there and um i've seen that for lots of things and and it's just you can't watch it because it's just great whatever it might be and um there's one where i was so impressed and it's called wabbit it's basically the looney looney tunes uh characters bugs and daffy and all those but in this more sort of stylized very punchy way of uh, you know, character design mm. but the voice performances are fantastic the writing's great the animation is wonderful the music's spot on and it's one of those rare times when you go yeah they nailed it absolutely nailed it so it's one of those things yeah. where you watch it ready to hide behind the sofa but it was done so well it was um it shows it can be done and mm -hmm. hopefully we, we we did a similar thing with Danger Mouse, I, I hope. It's like the Wallace and Gromit. Uh, yeah, I'm hugely influential, yeah. yeah. It's probably the only thing you you haven't been, oh, never mind, you have worked with Ardman. Wallace and Gromit, they've got a new film coming out next year. It's the first since Peter Salas passed away. Yes. So for me, it's like, ooh, will it, you know, will it work basically and be as good as the others? Yeah, I, I, I'm as confident as I could be that it's... It, um, that, that it will be they they get this right because the oh god the guy that's performing it now that is ben whitehead from what i've heard he is pretty good yeah and they'd have only brought him in if he was you know it's it's that so uh and and the writing will be you know it'll be top draw they 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 get it right and that's you know precious so for for him to do that, yeah, I mean, it, it's all going to be down to the the the, the animation, the writing, the it's it's everything. It's not just one thing, but I imagine the performance would be great. It's still um, Nick Park and stuff, you know, who made it, and I think that's a big a big part of it as well. The the artistry behind it is is quite incredible. If you ever get the chance to do a tour around any studio or see any of the sets from these films, mm -hmm. please do because it is. It's massively inspiring. It's one of these things that you see that kind of work and it makes you want to do stuff. By the way, I've just, I've found, um, I found a picture that, we, that I made to show you earlier. Oh yeah. It, it, it's, it's just purely just fun. That studio I was saying about that we recorded Rory the Racing Car and Fifi the Flower Dots and a whole bunch, and Thunderbirds and loads of others in. David Jason just came out of the studio. Oh God. And you know, he, you know, he was, you know, obviously only Fools and Horses, but, but to me, it was Danger Mouse, Duckula and Wind in the Willows. Oh yes, he played mm -hmm. Toad in this beautiful version of Wind in the Willows that that Cosgrove Hall created, and you know it, it stands up well now, as, right next to anything else. It was exquisite. The music was a proper orchestral soundtrack, and this is the early '80s, and they did a full-length feature film of this, and he that was one of the, the key performances again that that was part of the the jigsaw that made me do what I want to do. And then David, you know, Jason walked out and I thought, I know you're not meant to do this, but I just said, look, can I grab a picture, please? <laughs> I said, I, I said can, I, can I just say thank you? Because, you know, your work means so much to me. Yeah. Oh, and, and I said, it's your, I said, your performance of Toad in Wind of the Willows was just up there with as good as it gets. I said, look, I know I'm not meant to ask. This. He is one of the best. <laughs> so he allowed me to, heck, you know, whoop, one of those. And then whoop, there you go. <laughs> That's crazy. You, sometimes you just have to. It, apparently, my dad walked in the room once and found my granddad intently watching the TV. 
And he goes, what are you watching? And he was really concentrating on it. And it was The Wind in the Willows. And um, oh. he pointed at the screen and went, look at the puppets, man, quote unquote. Look at the puppets, man. That's great. So they're amazing. And that was... That's just came back into my mind. Well, they are. They one thing I used to love working at Cosgrove Hall um, Studios was the the recording the recording uh, studio was re- was right next to where they actually filmed the stuff, and so once I'd once I'd done my bits, I I would just go and and hang out in the in the studios. Or the, um, there was a there's a woman called Bridget Appleby, and to me she was she was Mother Cosgrove, and was she like created these sculptures and things and she had these shelves in her office and it was the british stop motion hall of fame basically so it was chilton the wheelies it was cosgrove hall uh, andy pandy um fifi Roy, everything if there was anything that was stop motion she kind of had it on her shelf and she probably ended up making the models for it and the, the there was the there was this one thing that just like fall into pieces, and <laughs> and it was the Mister Toad oh, no. models or all the latex because it was I, this is, must be early two thousands, the the latex from the original models from the early eighties mm. had just like disintegrated because it wasn't meant to last it was meant to be used in in this TV show, um, my friend Wes in in Manchester, he's taken the archive and, and he's been part of restoring all of this stuff. Oh wow. So so now there's you you'll go and see exhibitions in you know around the place where there's these things that otherwise would have just fallen to pieces and, and been lost forever that have been really loved and cared for and restored. And there's uh, he's he's also got all the all these Ray Harryhausen puppets. Oh God. There was a Ray Harryhausen TV show that I don't think ever came to air, but the, but I went round at the warehouse there, and they're they're there, and there's you go, I I just I just was in awe of all this because you see this with things like um, lost sets from Postman Pat or name it, you know, because in the end, part of the problem with a lot of this stuff is, is where do you store it? You know, the archive, the archiving of, of these bits of treasure to me is so important because it's part of the fabric of this work's history. Have you heard of uh, the Ardman fire? Oh, God, yeah, yeah. Heartbreaking, where, where so much was lost. It's reminding us of that, yeah. Oh, yeah, just t- awful. I did a video on it, and it was said at the time, or oh, nothing was salvaged. But interestingly, since then, you're getting these odd pictures of, like, half-burnt yeah. grommets and stuff. And a lot of people are saying, oh, well, they've, um, they've actually saved this set and this set. So there are, they managed to get some. But um, very sad, yeah. Oh, did you see, did you get to see Muppets at the O2? No. <laughs> Unfortunately, did you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I did. Yeah, that um, was. Um, it was Matt Vogel, wasn't it? So it was fairly recently. Yeah, yeah. It was a few. Yeah, there was. Um, it, it was so exciting to see that live. There was, a, there was. It was a bit stop start. There were a few technical things, but you know what? There was so much love in the room, and I, um, the people I saw around me, there was. It was just full of people around me that were involved in that kind of world. So there was, I mean, I, um, right next to where I was sat, there was um, Phil Fletcher hacking the dog. I saw an interview with him recently, and he seems really cool. <laughs> oh, Phil's great. I was with him a couple of weeks ago yeah. at Comic Con, in in uh, yeah, and, and and again, just uh, immensely fun. A few years ago, he did a thing. Um, we were in Birmingham uh, doing there was some event, and Phil was doing. Oh, here we are. Uh, whoop, there you go. Uh, there's there's Phil on the far right. Ooh. And, is that, I want to say, Hartley hair? Yes, it is. It is. Thank you, Father. I only knew that from my dad. <laughs> there you go. From, do you know the name of the show? Ooh, hang on. It's not Pipkins, is it? It's Pipkins, yeah. <laughs> it's, it, is, it is Pipkins, yeah. Um, so, and I used to love Pipkins. And again, puppets, it was all puppets. But yes, yeah, so that, that's um, there, there's Hartley hair for wow. you. And um, Hartley Hare was it was performed by a guy called Nigel Plaskett, yes. and he went on to be a major puppeteer name, the, you know, in terms of PG Tips Monkey, right? Yeah, yes, he is. Okay, you haven't met the monkey as well, have you? I got oh, I got God. better than that. <laughs> Don't do this to us. <laughs> okay, let me just sidestep a second. Nigel Plaskett also went on to train them the puppeteers for Avenue Q. 
and help set up Sesame Streets and, and train people around the world. So, PG Tips Monkey. I was I was part of the auditions for being the voice of the PG Tips Monkey. <laughs> oh, no way. Yes. So they were sorting the PG Tips Monkey out. And I was in the uh, auditions to be the voice of the PG Tips Monkey. And so it was Nigel that was the puppeteer of the PG Tips Monkey. And then Johnny Vegas as, you know, monkey and all this stuff. And so in the auditions, we... Um, I was basically, we were ad living mostly. Well, no, I think all of it was ad living. Um, now, for the actual commercial, you'd clearly get a script because there needs to be focus and a key message in the <laughs> commercial. Mm. But Nigel was there with, with the puppet actually performing it. So I was ad living and he's performing wow. it and we were working together and it just shows how well it works. And it went really well. We went through all these things and we got back to about the third. Um, version of it and it was really good it was re it was really good in fact the, the, the person that brought me in originally they told me what the fee was going to be for the first commercial and i thought don't tell me oh. that because if this doesn't happen <laughs> this is be a bit of a oh, shame no. oh yeah so anyway so it got down um I was told, look, they're gonna have to make a decision in two weeks because the because it goes you know in, they need to record it in two weeks so you know it, something's going to happen pretty quick. So we did this last, this last casting for it, and it was myself and this uh, and and, a, and another person, mm. and um, and we just got on great. We're chatting away, and then they bring they bring him in, and and it was in front of the actual client, you know, Mister Mister Tips, <laughs> and uh, so there's there's my and then he did it, and then I did mine, and it went really well. One of those where you walk out of the room with a bit of a strut, mm. kind of going, you've done it as good as you can do it, and it might be up there with as good as maybe anyone else would have done it in for that for what they're looking for. So I walked out feeling very proud, and then didn't hear anything. And as time goes by, and you go, well, it's we, I know they're going to start recording in, we've got two weeks. So 10 days go, goes by, and I get a phone call from the guy that called me in the first place. And he said, he said we've just heard back. You didn't get it. Oh. <laughs> no, no. I said, but they wanted you to know why. Now, you don't normally mm. get to hear this stuff. You don't normally get told why you didn't get a job, why I didn't get this a role. And they said, they said, they, the, 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 so the client feedback was they absolutely loved what you both did equally. The advertising agency were pushing for me they said, because that we'd worked together before and they knew how I would work in a studio. And the clients said they don't want to be um, swayed by that. They want to be go on their own judgment based on what they've seen. Fair enough. Mm. So all this time went by and literally he had to make a, he had to make a call that morning and he couldn't decide. So he tossed a coin. Oh, no. He tossed <laughs> a coin. What? I'd never get over that. <laughs> yeah. Well, guess how I felt. So you go, what? So, yeah. So he tossed. So I that gig um, was not mine because of a toss of a coin. So originally what they wanted was something very librarian-ish. Hello, Mug. You know, yes, I want a nice cup of tea. That's a spot on impression. <laughs> so, well, it, well, the thing is at the time, it, it wasn't an impression. It was just the brief I'd been given. Mm. It was li literally just that. So that's what he sounded like. Yeah. It was all very fun and mm, fancy some biscuits. Hmm, nice. So it was that, and and uh, and yes, so that's how that ha that's how that happened. <laughs> but you know, you said you'd be gutted if you heard that that they tossed a, the reason you didn't get that role was because someone tossed a coin. Well, initially, I I felt somewhat disappointed, but then then I thought, you know what? Actually, that's the best possible reason I could have been given for not getting the role. Well, it really couldn't find any faults. So, yeah, it was one of those where you go, there's nothing else I could have done to mm -hmm. to make it better or to give myself a better chance of, of getting that role. I didn't get the role, but it's, it's a good one. Well, that was something to just <laughs> pull out at the blue. Yeah, um, but the, the other one, um, Fifi and the Flower Tots, we did something quite unusual with that. Well, uh, um, I ended up recording every episode twice again. 
Wow. And they redubbed it for America. So um, what happened was they they felt that for the for the American market, it was more likely to be um, accessible and more of a, a, a first choice if it was in uh, Native American accents. So I so we recorded the whole thing again with with American accents. So Bumble went from bouncing blueberries, Fifi, Fifi, forget me not, forgot to bouncing blueberries, Fifi, Fifi, forget me not, forgot. And, and so it was like that guy now. Hi, I'm... And he wasn't called Bumble. Oh. They changed his name. I think there was a copyright issue or trademark uh. issue in America. So they changed his name and they had to find another name that fitted two lip flaps. Bumble. Oh, wow. And we ended up, Fuzzbuzz. <laughs> Hi, I'm Fuzzbuzz. Wow. So Fuzzbuzz. It's fascinating, all this stuff. Yeah, and yeah. we did... Well, you wouldn't know. I, 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 I don't think I've seen a version of it with the American voice on that. And, and so, and, and there was an, another interesting thing in terms of how character performance is just a tiny thing can change the character. So Slugsy was like this pretty much. He's lovable, huggable, and a bit moist, him. Well, we had to perform him with an American accent. So same character, but with an American accent, there was a problem that developed was without realizing it, I just created the voice of Homer Simpson. So, because you, you take Slugsy and you take, you make it American. Mm. Anytime there wasn't an S, it was like, okay, over here then. Come on, you. No. And you go, Marge, come on, boy. No! And your face, Flannery. And you know, it's not exactly Homer Simpson in an American accent, but when you hear that, it's close so that somebody might make a comparison. Mm. I was adding as much slime as I could. Hello. The, the key to animated success is moisture. <laughs> Did you know Jim Henson came to Birmingham? No. My hometown. And I, I tried <laughs> to find this bit of footage for you uh, a couple of days ago, and it's been taken down. There was a show called The Saturday Show. I forget what day it was on. And it was a replacement show for a very famous show called Tiz Was, which was... Pure anarchy. So the, on the Saturday show, they had a puppet season. So, um, and I ended up being in the audience for one of these shows. Turns out I was on the one uh, that had Roland Rat. Um, so <laughs> I missed Jim Henson by a week. Oh. But, it, but so <laughs> Fraggle Rock was just starting uh, on UK TV, and Jim Henson was the guest on the Saturday show, and wow. it was done literally 20 minutes drive from here at Central TV Studios in Birmingham. Um, I didn't get to see him, but I watched it live, and there is footage of this somewhere. Um, anyway, and he brings out a doozer, and he shows how it works, the remote control thing. And it was, uh, again, all these connections, it's just, it was, it's all part of the stuff that makes you want to do this for your yeah, living. It's probably quite rare footage, I'd imagine. Yeah, they, they wipe... Yeah, they wiped so much, and with things like the Saturday Show and his was, they 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 were not really uh, well. Anything that was recorded was wiped. I think pretty swiftly. Speaking of uh, wiping and stuff like that, you did the Scooby Doo and Shaggy and Johnny Bravo stuff on Cartoon yes. Network. Yeah, I saw recently that Johnny Bravo that you did is lost media. <laughs> Well, unless you have it in your garage or something. Unless you go to my archive, I've got Ooh. everything. Wow. I have everything. Do you know there's like a big search for that? I, I, yeah, I found this. It's an American guy, isn't it? I think it was. I saw a video of, of what he. Yeah, there's done. been a few. Yeah, it was called JBVO. Uh, there, were a couple, there was JBVO and there were a few of them. And I was brought in. There was Jeff who did it in America. And then I was Johnny for the UK for, I think it was four years for Cartoon Network. And it was huge. I mean, it was, it was, we were getting, like, we became number one in, in any, out of all the kids' shows, the way we did Johnny Bravo Live. And I've got the, the final se series, which I think is the best looking version, technically. I, I have that. I'm, I, I'm, I'm trying to find where that's gone. But I, I've got everything. So I will have to get that up and shared. I've got, I, I literally have, I, and I took behind the scenes footage of, Pretty much every project I've worked on, going right back to Cosgrove Hall in the late 90s. That's exactly what I would do. But, well, people weren't then, 
because the, like like the iPhone was what 2007. Yeah. So before that, there weren't you know you didn't see people with camera phones. So I was taking a video camera with me, literally late 90s to stuff. So so Johnny Bravo, uh, I got asked to. This is a little bit crazy. This character who's like a big male himbo, like half Elvis, uh, and it was like, yeah, man, oh mama. Oh, yeah, do the market with me. Come on. It was all this stuff. Uh, and uh, a lot of that, man, Johnny Bravo. <laughs> and um, probably more Johnny Bravo. But we, but we did that for four years. Um, I'm pretty certain it was, it was at least three, but I'm pretty sure it was four. And we did it twice a year. And it was, we did, uh, I was doing, I was doing a lot of work for Cartoon Network at the time. So it was, it was stuff for, I uh, did stuff for CITV and for Cartoon Network and commercials and radio and toys. And we even did, there was even a Kellogg's Frosty's Johnny Bravo box, <laughs> which I have. We did a Kellogg's, I, so I was the voice of Johnny for that as well. But yeah, so we did um, JBVO live and it was, it was um, we took calls and there was a game that you played live with Johnny. I've got behind the scenes footage of it. Wow. Yeah, so that needs to be I shared. Mean, people can't even see half of the actual episodes there's like a page on it it's got the clips that exist in green and then loads of them in red that they haven't found and just don't yeah. exist well it sounds like i need to start clipping out what's in my what's in my vault because there's a lot break the internet mark yeah i think i might <laughs> break the internet jordan but yeah but it's great so we've got the behind the scenes footage of, of one of them there was in fact ah uh, there was a game, like a match game. You know the thing where you see the things and they and they, they shuffle them up and then they cover them up and then you have to choose one and three, two and four, and, and then oh, yeah. you can yeah. match. You know, it, it's that. So, you know, apple, one and three, apple, apple, match, move on. And, and, uh, so there was this game where you played it with Johnny. You came on and, oh. yeah, man, JBVO, you know, it's like you're trying to play the match game. Oh, mama. And, and all this stuff going on. And... Um, the, the people that programmed the game, there was an error in the coding of the game where they forgot to show you what, what it was before they covered them up. Oh, no. So basically, you, you, you're just playing blind because the idea is they show you these things, shuffle them up, you have to remember them, and then they, they cover them up. They have to remember one and three, two and five, and match of these matches. Well, they forgot to show you what they were to start off with. So it was it was almost impossible to win. Pure accident. So people come on and every <laughs> you might get a winner every now and then, but it was just it was very hard to win this game. Not through any intention, it was just very hard to win the game. And so it was Johnny Bravo like who's on the line? And it was and the line was dead. Oh no! <laughs> live TV. So we've got we got like we got to fill thirty seconds of live TV. And and and, and then in, in in talkback, all I can hear is a lot of swearing in the control room on live talkback in my ears. <laughs> in, in my in my ear holes, wow. and so and and I said they went they it's okay go go straight to the cartoon go straight to the cartoon. I went who's on the line? No one. I went you know why? I'm going to show you how to play the game. Right, one and four. <laughs> and I played it. And I went, great, great, great. Go, 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 yeah, do that. So I went, one and four. And he went, match. And, right, total fluke. One and four, <laughs> bing, match. Three and six, In a day. bing, match. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Five and nine, bing, 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 match. I just want me a PlayStation. Here's Cow and Chicken. <laughs> and was, That's amazing and then, and then all I could hear... In the in my ear holes was applause because we'd played it as if it was live, yeah. as as it filled the same time as it would have done with the caller, and then and, and I won. It's incredible. I wonder if that episode is out there or not. I don't think so. I'm I'm pretty certain. Or in I've your got archive, that. at least. Probably yeah. But we but we found out afterwards what happened, why you couldn't hear the caller, mm. and what it was during lunch. A cleaner came in, did some hoovering, and knocked the cable out the wall. <laughs> it was that simple. She was just doing a nice thing, making it all nice and fresh oh, for us. It. And she put, I came out the wall and Johnny won a PlayStation. And that, that's what's great about live work, because sometimes it can be even better than you planned it. Something goes wrong and, and you, you, make, you make that moment come to life and you make it more than it ever would have been otherwise. It's nice that. 
It's incredible the the Johnny Bravo stuff and Shaggy and Scooby as well. Obviously, huge characters, and you got to play them in the intervals. Yeah. It was pretty early on, just playing around in studios. Like you know, if you got a guitar in the studio, you'll start playing other tracks. You just will. And so, playing around in studios when I started out, um, you know, you start saying stuff with Scooby and Shaggy or other characters and things, and you just do it. And um, so people, so people knew that I could perform the characters, and they knew I could perform them pretty accurately. And so in '98, Warner Brothers they moved Scooby from being a Hanna Barbera character into the Warner Brothers selection of you know, family of characters, and I was brought in to be a guest on Radio One's breakfast show with with Zoe Ball at the time to perform the voice of Scooby-Doo. And it's kind of just cool. It's like, like, it's really creepy, Scooball pal, buddy of mine. Right, Scoob? Yeah, right. <laughs> and it's like, and again, it, it, it's like, like finding your own version. It's like um, the original Shaggy was Casey Kasem. So this is Casey Kasem. You know, this is Casey Kasem for the America's Top 40. Keep your feet in the ground and keep reaching for the stars. It's this kind of thing. And you take his voice and you kind of like make it higher and squeezed up a little bit. And it like, you kind of like got there. No. So it's, it's like throughout the years with different performers and different versions and different direction, it's kind of like pick your version. But, you know, g g give me the original version. I'll be able to match the note of it well. In my eyes, ears, head... It's continuing the legacy of what Dom Messick started. Mm. So in the same way that, you know, Jim Henson's my Kermit, Dom Messick's my, my Scooby. So it was that, it, it's that same thing that he did. Because later on, in some versions of Scooby, you'd hear Scooby talk, uh, actually say sentences. And like in the original Scoobies, he would, the character of Scooby would react to things or alert you through very, almost like simple, almost like barks. So, yeah, Scooby Snack, you know, Shaggy, Shaggy, it was all this stuff. I said, but then I've seen some versions where you'd see, yeah, we should go to the castle and find the bad guy, you know, yeah. which was never really, for mm. me, what I thought of uh, Scooby. It can still work, but mm. it was me basically continuing what Dom Messick started. So, a couple more notes I've got. You did some advertisements. You did the trailer for New Super Mario Brothers Wii. Yes. <laughs> then if you didn't remember. I remember that, yeah. And Doctor Who at some point. And it's weird because I remember these ads being on the TV. So I will have heard your voice a very long time ago. Oh, well, well, um, I can I can only apologise. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the, yeah, I was the, so yeah, it would have been New Super Mario Wii. Out now. It's all this stuff. It, it would have been all very exciting and energetic. Rediscover the magic as Mario goes multiplayer in the amazing new Super Mario Brothers Wii. And there'll be some, there was, there was, there's been lots of Doctor Who stuff I've done. The 11th Doctor has arrived with his new companion, Amy Pond, and new Sonic Screwdriver. He's confronted Hawthorne and the terrifying Smilers, Exterminate! And save planet Earth from a new race of Daleks. I've probably infiltrated your television viewing <laughs> in, in many different bits and pieces, but, um, yeah. but thank you for watching those commercials. Well, I managed to find them because they popped up. <laughs> so people have uploaded them. <laughs> That's great. They've learned everything. I'm stunned when I, I see my, the Wikipedia page that I have. Mm. I haven't put any of that stuff there. <laughs> Nothing. So, and what's great, we'll do a, we'll work on an animation series and literally within, you know, a few hours of the first one being up there, the entire episode list is up there. It's very I impressive. I don't, I don't know who does it. Me neither, but thank you very much <laughs> if it's you. Yeah, it honestly talked for hours, but not I think we that. have talked for oh. hours. What? Have we? What I, I, it's it's crazy, it's meant to be like an hour mind. show. No way. Never mind an episode of the series. This could just be the, the series. This is this the point. series. <laughs> well, look, uh, look, it's been so good talking to you, Jordan, and thanks for the good work you're doing too. Please uh, keep doing more. Thank you so much. Uh, Likewise, as we've said, apparently been in the background of my life for quite a while, so it's been really cool to talk to you. Find out stuff about BG Tips Monkey and all of that crazy secret stuff, in addition to what we already know about you. I toast a cold coffee in my Jim Henson mug in your general direction. I've got about an inch of water in the Pac-Man glass. So <laughs> <do>. <laughs> they are done. Thank you. So thanks very much, Mark. And thank you all for watching. 
If you enjoyed the video, leave your thoughts down there and check out Mark's amazing work. Yeah, I'm. I'm the website is marksilk.com, M-A-R-C-S-I-L-K.com, and I'm at Mark Silk on the socials. Say hello, please do, and tell us what you've enjoyed in our chat. We should do more of it. Definitely. Well, thanks everyone for watching, and we'll see you later. I think I've probably broken poor Mark. <laughs> yeah, Mark. Yeah. Thank you.